Hello and welcome to the second part of last week's episode. In case you didn't watch that one, it just so happens that it was all part of the fandom check episode. But then we got so into this second part that it honestly deserved its own episode. So that's what you're watching now. Just to give some context to the episode. Okay, so um, Higurashi, Umineko and Kikonia's powers from now on. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the episode of Until Now if you haven't read both of those. Uh, all of those, I mean. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, I guess we will see you again when the stage plays again. And now, for all those of us who have read the three things, uh, I guess we should read the story summary uh, for those who haven't read it. Basically, a new story came out for Higurashi Mei. There's a little summary of it, and we wanted to talk about what happens in it. So my, I propose each of us reach a paragraph so it doesn't become boring. Okay, but but first, yeah, I, I might just be out of touch with the fandom. But just to go over what is May, because it was something I forgot existed. It's the I think it's called May. Is it, uh, yeah, Higurashi May, uh, the mobile app, right? Yeah, let me just check if I'm not confusing it with the manga. No, okay, May is no, the No, that's manga Megari. Manga. Yeah, that's Megari. Yeah. So May is the, the phone game for Higurashi that has had many crossovers with other pieces of fiction, including Mineko. Um, and they, they keep uh, releasing new characters, and with each character comes a new story. And what we have here is a summary of... The new newest story. Yeah, and uh, for those of you who don't know, like the main plot of uh, May and what's going on, it's basically about this uh, teenage girl whose family died ten years ago in the Great Hinamizawa disaster, and um, she meets um, a uh, goddess who sends her back in time to 1986 to battle against some monsters and meet some other girls uh, from 1993 who also have connections to Hinamizawa. Uh, Hinamizawa, um, and you know they just like go through and they interact with the the old um, Higurashi Dude, gang sure. and uh, just do some weird shit. Um, it, it's it's a weird little little game. As for the the story that was released, so um, hey, hey, the, the, hey, is any of us playing May? I'm not. I, I they don't have English translations, otherwise I would. Okay, so none of us have played May, but. It's fine because it's a mobile game. I would and play. The stories are self-contained, so yeah, I, I've seen like some like clips of it, but mostly from the Yumi Neko crossover that they did. Yeah, when they released that again, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, each of us will read a paragraph. We can go in Discord orders. So casualty of the Anuus UA and Hanyu character story summary. Hanyu stands in UA. I'll, I'll call her UA. It's easier for me. Hanyu stands in Yuwa's ruined space in the Sea of Fragments, eating cream puff, and wonders why she lives in a place like that. The narration highlights how it's unfitting towards Yuwa's om omniscience and omnipotency. Yuwa says that it's a boring question, but even concentrating on answering that helps avoid boredom for a moment. She explains that the ruins around them are the result of the disease of boredom, a deadly disease that even the greatest witch can't escape from. The closer one gets to true omnipotency and omniscience, the closer you are to God, the easier it is to fall under it. Truthfully, you, Yua says that there is no such thing as a God. A being on that level would just sink to the bottom of the sea of fragments and disappear into dust. One becomes bored of everything and then disappears into nothing. Hanyu questions that, since humans don't die of boredom, but Ewa argues that humans are never truly bored. They can imagine daydream. Hanyu wonders if Ewa doesn't have an imagination. Ewa argues that fantasy is born from the unknown. If you know everything, there is no room for fantasy. Hanyu talks about how, uh, how once she heard the ho-ho cry of a bird and then drew it based on her imagination, making Ewa smile a bit. Ewa talks about how once you know everything, even the pleasure of creating is lost. A human can be delighted once a blueprint becomes a palace, because during that creation, it won't just be the initial drawing, uh, but a palace Ewa brings into existence will be completely known to her from the start. There's nothing interesting about it. Hanyu wonders whether Yua never feels surprises, and concludes that being omniscient and omnipotent is boring. Yua talks about how, in spite of that, she tries to stave off boredom. A useful tool for that is calculations. Even for a moment, she can feel like she doesn't know everything once she delves into more and more complex calculations. 
comparing it with rolling dice, where rolling 100 dice with multiple sides staves off boredom more than a single six-sided die. Right now, this Hinamizawa you has found is like that. There are multiple dice rolled around and their results influence each other. It takes even Yua a bit to catch up with everything going on in these fragments. Hanyu had finished her cream puff and asks for another one, but suddenly it turns cold and says she's bored. Hanyu berates Yua on how pathetic she is. She needs help just to talk by herself. Even worse than that, Yua adds that humans would mock her for playing two different roles to pretend to hold a conversation. They move in synchrony and snap their fingers. Then Hanyu falls as a lifeless doll. Hanyu is just a Hanyu-shaped piece of Yua, like a puppeteer talking with her own puppet. Ewa snaps her fingers and seven colored, um, seven colored fragments appear around her, then several potato chips. She jumps onto the sofa like a child and asks the, uh, asks the children of man within the fragments to stay off her boredom disease. Then she seemingly addresses the players, saying that, the, saying that just as they watch her, she watches them. And I have a, I have a feeling that uh, this uh, summary came to us courtesy of Ezcori, but we should probably link to the original one in the description of this video. Okay, so that'll be in the description. And yeah, uh, I brought up we could uh, discuss this on the episode because um, I've seen some people like not wanting to accept that Fedrin and you are the same people and that Hanyu is just a uh, a piece of them and this text basically confirms it and and that's cool because that's the, the only way I, I think is a, a good interpretation of it because Higurashi does have a meta world it's just that you don't see it during Higurashi because Ryukishi hadn't thought it that far but with Umineko knowledge you can retroactively interpret rightfully so now that we have confirmation that Higurashi's meta world is basically just uh, uh, Feadrin writing a story for herself, by herself. Of herself. Yeah, and looking it through the eyes of Han Yu, who is a non looker canonically. In game, she is a non looker She can't interact with anything but Rika, which is what Feadrin is. She's just a non looker She's not a character in the story. She didn't write herself to be a character in the story. Yeah, Higurashi's meta world has always existed. We just didn't get to see it. Mm-hmm. And we did vaguely via Riga and the Sea of Fragments and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but it's not on the, it's not on the same level as a higher meta world where Feathering would be. It's, it's kind of like just like a space in between loops that Rika I, gets. I appreciate space. the expansion upon mm-hmm. the connection between Hanyu and, um, and Feathering and Yua and uh, it because mm-hmm. that that sort of it sort of connects to the whole thing about how um, uh, Burn Castell and Rika uh, are like uh, Han Solo and Indiana Jones, played by the same actor. Uh, there's some overlap between the characters. Uh, they're like different. The same actor playing different roles. It's sort of like how. Well, basically, it's not that Han Yu became Feathering over time. Or that Feathering became a Hanyu or something. They're like different versions of the same character being retold in different ways. It's it's like uh, Hanyu is Hanyu is Feathering self insert, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's that's always been my personal theory that like Hanyu is Feathering self insert, all of the same way Erica is Burn Castell self insert. I, I honestly yeah. wouldn't be surprised if Burn got the idea from. <laughs> feathering on like how to do that because you know like erica is very similar looking to burn but isn't like an exact replica like mm-hmm. how rika is whereas um you know on is very similar looking to feathering but like isn't like exactly her like the way ay is it, like looks exactly like feathering feathering making yeah. herself insert shorter than her uh kind of a mood though i want to i want to make myself insert little and cute and uh, say, <laughs> yeah. say little catchphrases. How, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and the good thing is that you don't have to call that a theory anymore. That's the best part of this. Like It's just straight up true now. I mean, there's a lot of ways you, you can um, still like interpret that. Um, like, 
for for example, my my personal theory has always been, and this is just kind of added fuel to that, is that Higurashi is like a game between um, Featherine and Lambda Delta that yes yes Featherine got bored of um, because. Hanyu, um, not Hanyu, um, because Takano kept winning over and over again, and the outcome became predictable, and Featherine abandoned Hanyu, her piece, to, like, the the whims of the, um, the game board, you know, like, here, you figure this out, because, like, you know, this is, like, basically a logic error, where like it is an impossible victory condition, you have to figure out how to beat it. Um, and I'm I'm not doing that. Yeah. I can't think. I have no brain. Um, <laughs> it, like she's she's done. She's bored. Like it gets predictable. She doesn't really want to think about it anymore. And um, the whole ow ow that Han Yu says is calling Feathering back to the board. And I believe that Rika was a piece, much like how like people in Umineko are pieces, like how like. Ava or Rosa is a piece who's unaware of the meta board, but like Battler got risen to the level where she could interact with the meta world eventually um, via like awareness and like kind of getting pulled in by Hanyu, who was the only person other than yeah. like, Lambda who did have meta connections. And that um, version of Rika, who was in the meta world and playing the game and like taking control of the pieces and all these different realities is the one who eventually became Ern Castell. Um, and the, obviously the Rika who got the happy ending in Higurashi is just like a piece who is no longer really fully aware of the meta world and just living is the life. He's the character who goes on to become uh, Higurashi, Go and Sotsu Rika. Yeah, and I've always kind of imagined um, the whole like <laughs> red eye thing of like, oh, this is like the witch taking direct control of their piece and speaking through it. Um, rather than the piece like acting on its own, how it normally oh, would in the situation. I actually interpret that slightly different, because I think she's 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 always in. It's okay in Umineko. You like the people on the meta world are straight up different people from the people in in the game board. I think in Higurashi it's different. Like Higu Castell is always Rika. It's just that she's playing the role of Rika, and when I guess the red eyes in Go is just to symbolize that she's no longer. Playing Rika, she's straight up being Hugo Castell now. Ah, yeah, I, I can see it either way. I, either way, it's kind of like a signal of like Burn Castell is talking through um, Rika right now. It's not using. Rika. Yeah, because I think in Higurashi, in Higurashi, you don't the, the like the pieces don't move on their own. Like you are the piece. Whilst in Higura in Mumineko, you are watching a world where the pieces are moving on their own. I mean, it's more like. I, at least in Umineko, how I've interpreted it is you can move the pieces like directly, like Battler controls his own piece directly and stuff like that. Um, but you don't have to because regardless, pieces will act like, you know, appropriately right. to I, the situation if you're not controlling them. Uh, but you can only control a piece in a way that makes sense for their character. I always come back to this scene that um, I, I always think it's more important uh, that Battler in uh, episode two he has a line when he's talking to jessica in like the the lounge or whatever the heck that room was but uh they're having a con yeah it's not my turn yet it's always the, uh, it's not my turn i, yet. I think very relevant to battler's failure in the early part of the story where he's just waiting and waiting and waiting and he's following kyrie's advice a little too closely and he's not taking any big moves and so i think that relates to how pieces mm -hmm. like he's not directly it's more like uh in that moment is he's waiting and he's not taking control of his piece and so the piece is just kind of reflecting that attitude almost mockingly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah like the, the attitude of the player on the meta world influences the way the piece moves because they are theoretically the same person with the same nature i, I think i mentioned this before go to be a game between burn castell and lambda delta the one they played right before Amin echo um, that, like, Lambda lost, mm -hmm. um, got her title stolen away from her, because I, I do feel like by the end of, uh, Higurashi, Lambda Delta was also like, I'm kind of sick of, like, winning all the time, so, like, I'm gonna give you, like, the mir- like, not, like, consciously, but, like, the miracle was that Lambda Delta got sick of giving Takano certainty over and over again, like- <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, like, she she's just like, I keep winning, and, like, this is getting predictable, and my game partner's kind of left, and you're not winning, so, like, oh well. And then she, like, looked away from the game board for two seconds, and then Rico won. She's like, what the fuck? And Go is kind of like a rematch of, like, okay, you're beating me fair and swear this time, and by beating me, mean, I mean, I'm gonna beat you. And then she got her ass handed to her again. <laughs> what Bert Castell didn't know was that this time one that out the certainty was that she would lose. <laughs> Yeah, I had a question about something you said, Worf, because when you were talking about your mm-hmm. interpretation, you said that uh, Higurashi was a game between Lambda and Featherin, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I, I agree with the Lambda Delta and Fe- Featherin part, I don't agree with the game part. I don't think they were pulling against each other, I don't think it was a game at all. Maybe I'll just read what I posted on the text channel the other day, but I think it... It it was an it was a game from Rika's perspective because she was trying to flee. It was like an escape mm-hmm. room for her. But on Featherin and Wanda's level, it was mostly just a thought exercise, I guess. And Wanda was aiding Featherin in it oh, metaphorically, because Featherin wouldn't let Rika escape. So Wanda Delta is the certain. It's it's like the fact that Featherin wouldn't let Rika escape. Ah, see, because I always um. It interpreted the game, and obviously, like, it's a game on fair footing, um, because otherwise Featherin would kick Lambda's ass, um, but part of that, um, like, interpretation of mine of being a game is also part of the reason why I think Lambda Delta had that small sliver of confidence to actually stand up to Featherin of, like, okay, I might actually have a chance here to beat her, because, like, I did so well in Higurashi, and then she forgot that, like, Featherin was not giving it her all in Higurashi. <laughs> You're in her domain her domain now. Uh, mm. Yeah, like, Higurashi was Lambda Delta's domain. Like, that was, I, I would say that, like, Higurashi is Lambda Delta's game board, um, because, like, she's, like, the main source of conflict there, kind of like how Beato is the main source of conflict. Yeah, I also, board. um, yeah. I mean, the, the reason I the reason I don't think it was a game at all in Higurashi on on the upper layer is just because Lambda doesn't want Rika to win because she's on Takana's side. Featherin doesn't want Rika to win because Hanyu is her ex spy and Hanyu doesn't want Rika to win. She wants to keep her perpetually tied just like Lambda. So like, who the fuck is on Rika's side on the upper layer? No one. So it can't be a game uh, without an opponent. Does Hanyu want her to? be stuck or does she want Rika to just live and her being stuck as a consequence of like that wait who who are you talking about Hanyu because I I I I may be just misremembering uh but I always thought Hanyu just didn't want Rika to die but because of Lambda Delta certainty she kept dying anyway so Hanyu keeping her perpetually in there um and like prolonging her suffering isn't because she doesn't want Rika to not escape the loops um she just wants Rika to keep on living I think it's because she's hopeless yeah, she she's just hopeless that, like, Rika can't get out of there, and that's after, like, hundreds of loops of just, like, Hanyu being like, I, I give up, but I still want you to live. But I don't think Hanyu would, like, stop Rika from, like, continuing to live if she did beat Takano, because, like, clearly she didn't, you know? Oh, no, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. But, I mean, she she is in on the let's keep Rika in this, because Rika very definitely wants to die on a meta level. It's Hanyu who doesn't allow her to. Yeah, because otherwise Rika wouldn't be able to fight against Takano and eventually win. Um, it's just like Hanyu became a defeatist after like so long and after Featherine abandoned the game board that it felt like impossible to win. So Hanyu's just like, well, at least you're alive and like we just gotta like give up because like whatever. Like it's not possible. We're not solving this logic error, you know? So you think Featherine was trying to to, to beat uh, one this game? I, I think she put it on Hanyu to do it. And I think she eventually got bored of watching Hanyu because, you know, if Feathering, like, gave it her all, she would beat Lambda, like, easy. But I think, like, to make it interesting for herself, to make it a game, she put the weight on Hanyu, which is why Hanyu has so much, like, narrative power and is able to keep Rika in the loops and has, like, this meta awareness. I think to connect what you two are saying, it's it's definitely related to that thing that Lambda describes about the what the, uh, what the logic error is and about... Um, Burn Castell having been trapped in one before, and she had she was trapped in one before. But it was there was the in the manga panel of uh, Rika and Tanyu being trapped, and it alluded to Burn Castell having been trapped in a logic error because uh, basically Feathering gave up on her. So I guess it's sort of like Rika was not a player 
she was more like a pawn through which uh, Hanyu, which is uh, Bradbury's actual piece. Yeah, that's that's kind of like what I was saying with like how like I believe that Rika was a piece who got elevated to meta level, like how Battler was a piece in episode one who got elevated to the meta level and like started controlling his own pieces. Yeah, she wasn't his- just elevated. It's almost like she elevated herself. Like, she was probably given the rank of witch by Featherine. Yeah, yeah. But... Exactly. After Higurashi happened. Yeah, because there's also the scene with uh, Frederica Burncastel, uh, which I think is probably an elevated Rika, but not Burncastel as we see in Umineko. Yeah, because I think, you know, Burncastel got her Witch of Miracles title because she defeated Higurashi. And I think, like, the easiest way to, like, compare, like, the why I think, like, Featherine was having Hanyu play the game for her as, like, her, like, piece in the meta world is very, like, similar to how Bern Castell was having Erica play Beato's game for her. But she, Erica was still a piece in the meta world because, you know, that way she can blame it on the piece if she loses. Like, oh, Erica <laughs> lost for me. Erica sucks. Um, and I, I feel like it makes sense for Bern Castell to do that if she's you know has witnessed featherine do something like that before with hanyu where she put all the pressure on this piece with the meta knowledge to figure out the game and then you know is being kind of cruel to the piece abandoning it to the whims of the game so like brent was like oh well i mean this is how this is how uh my old uh person um whatever um Featherine, that's how she played it. Um, so, like, I might as well do the same. Um, so, so how what what would the real Mineko world um, interpretation of it actually being a game between Featherine and Wanda be? Would it be like Featherine started writing this story and then got bored of it? She, like, she she gave up on the story, shoved it to a corner, and then the story just kept happening without her. I think it's Lambda Delta's story. Like, Takano is the one in control, and she, whether or not uh, Takano is uh, Lambda is another story entirely, but Takano is her XB, as you said before. Uh, yeah, she's the one mm-hmm. who's, like, yeah. Lambda is um, betting on, I guess. She's like, okay, I'll keep supporting you, so as long as you remain uh, dedicated to your certainty then I'll keep being the Witch of Certainty and I'll make this happen. So it's almost like there's a conflict of powers here where uh, Featherine slash Hanyu has the power to sort of loop this time over and over again, even though it's diminishing over hundreds and hundreds of years. And Lambda has the power to keep that certain outcome on lock. So I think the game just sort of arose as a conflict between these two powers. Oh my god, you just yeah. made me think of... S- okay, this is gonna s- sound kind of crazy. I- I'm gonna have <laughs> to ask you to put your thin file hats on. Because I am... Okay. I'm about to... F- I'm about to propose batteries on you. Oh shit. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, going on with the idea that... Okay, it was a, a game, an actual game that was... Featherin was essentially <laughs> playing it with her... Eikuko, I mean, was essentially playing it with herself as she was writing it. But on a meta layer, it was Featherin versus Wanda. And then eventually, mm-hmm. yeah, she, they got, uh, Featherin got bored of watching Hanyu failing, shoved the story to a side, never thought of it again. And so the story was, it had been started, it had been developed, but it hadn't been finished. So like one day, Toya found it and started reading it. And he felt bad for uh, Rika. So then he wrote a conclusion to the story. <laughs> so that's why Han Yu started feeling bad for Rika and let her escape. Because Toya has the heart. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of cute. It's a, it's a funny head. I, I, I kind of I, like that. Because, like, Feathering on a meta level is a combination of Ikigo and Toya. Um, so either way it works as Ah, it. shit, that's, that's right. No, that works yeah. against it, because Featherine does not come back to the plot. To the, to the, to I mean, the it thing. could be, like, you know, the side of Featherine that does have the heart. Um, that is Toya, is Hanyu. Um, and that's why, you know, the compassion starts feeling. But, like, the Ikigo part, um, the, the part that didn't really give a shit anymore left. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, wait a minute. And, yeah, and then the reason Ikuko, uh, the, the reason Wamba slash uh, Takano's um, certainty was broken was because Hanyu stepped onto the game board. So, an outsi- like, they needed an outsider. Like, they needed a change yeah. in the calculations. And it would be 
uh, Toya, he's an outsider. This was Ikuko's story. He stepped in. Yeah, because... <laughs> that, honestly, I, I kind of like that. And also kind of, like, makes a little bit of sense why Bird Castell might try to help Battler at the start of Umineko, because... <laughs> I scratch your back, you scratch mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even if Battler isn't aware of it, because Battler's not aware of anything, because he, he doesn't have the, that high, high level of awareness. Yeah, I cannot believe Battler um, is Bird. <laughs> no fucking way! Oh, well, we do know that... Uh, Battler is Burn because Burn says sometimes I'm you, but sometimes you're, I'm your best friend. Wait, no, this this makes even wait, wait, no, there ain't no way. Wait a minute, to- Toya was found without memories, and Ikuko kept him like a pet. You know what else Ikuko kept like a pet? Oh Her shit, cat Burn Castell. No way. <laughs> My um, God. no, um, shit, shit, shit. What was I? What was I gonna say? Um, I, I think the the best way to to view um, like to compare like how like the Hirashi game compared to the Umineko game works is um, you know like Featherine is is playing through her piece Hanyu who like basically she she makes the player kind of like how Burn Castell makes Erica the player and you know Lambda Delta is like directly supporting um, Takano and when you jump over to Umineko. Technically, before Erica comes in, Battler is Burn Castell's piece, who she is using and kind of like pushing forward and giving hints to for him to win the game for the mystery side. Whereas Lambda Delta is fully supporting Beato and like giving her that that oomph. So I, I feel like at least like witches on higher planes less uh, like play the games themselves and more pick players that they yeah. give their support. Which is why, like, you can excuse a game between Lambda Delta and Featherine with, like, why didn't Featherine kick her ass? Because, you know, she, she was betting on Hanyu to do that. She, she made Hanyu to yeah. <laughs> fight the game. Uh, you know what's also interesting is that now I'm thinking about Higurashi as literally one giant logic error. So let's imagine for a second, and we don't know this for sure, that Higurashi and Umineko... If they were both literal stories about a mansion blowing up and a, uh, a town with this uh, disease. If they were little stories that take place in the exact same universe, the exact same Japan, uh, then the true outcome of the Hinamizawa disaster is that it doesn't happen. The disaster just doesn't, and everyone comes out of Hinamizawa okay. Then the logic error is how did we get to this point where the outcome is for sure but just like how Battler has a sure outcome, but he didn't think about the oh, how to yeah. get there, now we have to figure out the perfect loop, the perfect outcome, in order to make this logic error not a contradiction, which also works. Because it's so hard to justify all these kids stopping the, <laughs> the fucking government <laughs> from their conspiracies. Yeah. There's the... The whole time limit is the... Is hold up it, like every time they loop it gets shorter and shorter by a little bit and that sort of represents a time limit in that they're trapped in this logic error forever but the time limit is basically how long can you keep sane before you become uh stop thinking and that's the time limit of when uh han Yu and rika and basically all of yeah yeah all of the people because by like the end like Hanyu's like basically giving up and Rika's kind of like giving up too because Hanyu's getting to her but like they, they keep going because Rika starts having like hope again that like she might be able to actually get out and that's kind of how we start getting our miracle worlds that's also interesting because maybe the reason that the time loop keeps shortening is a subconscious result of the fact that Hanyu is giving up is that it's not just that her power is growing weaker is that her will is growing weaker. Yeah. Therefore, she has less power. That's very true, because when I play Fire Emblem and I Divine Pulse, <laughs> this is... Okay, trust me. The, and I Divine Pulse to go back some turns, like, I'm not gonna go back to the entirety, to, to the beginning of the map, because I, I can't be bothered to go through it all over again, even though that gives me better odds at actually turning the situation around. I'm gonna go to the to the uh, sh- uh, f- um, closer turn where I can uh, reasonably avert the situation. Mm-hmm. So that, that does track with how we, we as people try to you know, take shortcuts and get bored right. if, if we have to backtrack a lot. Yeah, it's like playing a round of Fire Emblem, but someone said in Red Truth that you get out of the level with all of your pieces alive. Oh, yeah, so then you have to, like, keep playing until you do. That's that's smart. 
yeah, that that perfectly like encapsulates what the the Higurashi logic era seems to be. Mm. But um, uh, I I was I just kind of like as I was thinking about this, which is picking certain pieces to be their players and play the games for them makes so much sense when you consider the idea that they're actually trying to avoid getting into the logic era themselves because you know hanyu and rika were the ones in the logic era not feathering despite them being her pieces because feathering wasn't directly playing the game she she isn't directly combating the logic era they are um which makes sense you know like later on why like burn castell never directly play she only plays through battler and erica because if she does and she makes some kind of error, she she might get stuck in a logic right. error again. So, you know, like if Erica made a logic error, mm. she would get stuck mm. in it on um, instead of Burn Castell. I, I guess another thing about this story is that it talks about the disease of boredom, which is interesting in world building always. But in this case, they're trying to stave off boredom by participating in games, but they don't want to take too big of a risk and put themselves into it because then they might get trapped in a lo- logic error. So they're like, kind of like, coaching let's players it's like when you like <laughs> you know like you bring your friend over to your house you give them the controller to your xbox and you like watch them play skyrim and you're like wait no you should like go oh, over to that quest over there it's my, like really my cool. analogy and, just, and if they get stuck on the like the hard level you don't have to suffer through it you just you just watch them <laughs> and you go get like a soda from the fridge the analogy evolves because your friend came over and someone said in red truth that they have to beat a level of fire emblem without losing any of their pieces yeah exactly <laughs> that's that's how witches get you I feel like I've unlocked like a whole new new layer of uh, the meta space. Yeah, this is pretty good. I'm 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 happy with these these little little theory interpretations. We are unpacking a lot here. I I I always it, this always happens when we start talking about meta shit. We always end up coming up with new interpretations. It yeah. sounds super yeah. fucking cool. Yeah, I'm I'm really confident in my um, using pieces to avoid logic errors thing. I think that makes so much sense. Yeah, I'm very confident. In the idea of a logic error where they they have to find the perfect loop where the outcome that everyone made it out of the Hinami's out a disaster fine they have to get to that i'm very confident and proud of that too yeah which you know obviously doesn't only involve the disaster not happening but also no right. one's succumbing to l5 including like you know right. like takedo yeah. living as well um which is also like a really difficult thing to, to pull off i think in terms of like the perfect loop Cause like it's so easy to just kill Takano <laughs> and leave it at that. Yeah, because one of Rika's rules is that her friends have to make it out of this too. And you know, um, oh gee, I feel so bad for forgetting photo- photography man's name, Tomi Take. Tomi Take is her friend too, so that's another part of it. Tomi Take Flash. Tomi Take Flash. So like, I, I feel like Ta- Rika was always a little distressed whenever like Takano like death kind of came up in a loop because it's like oh shit we're already at a bad start <laughs> yeah because it always happens it's a bad mm-hmm. omen but since we are talking about Higurashi meta world I just wanted to to bring up the the thing we were discussing the other day it it doesn't uh fit in perfectly with what we've been discussing because now we're on the boat of oh yeah this was totally a game between Mamba and Featherin so I'm, j- I'm gonna try to adapt it just to leave it on record because the thing we were talking about the- about the other day was trying to infer what Ikuko was like in real life from how Higurashi and Umineko is constructed mm-hmm. and we were analyzing the possibility of Higurashi b- being written as a form of both SK's escapism and revenge piece on Ikuko's part because we do know that she's very socially awkward and isolated and has no friends and Higurashi is a story about friendship, so she on a, on, a, on a real life layer, it could be Yukuko writing it to try to experience friendship secondhand, which, if you think about it, is exactly what Han Yu is going through. She cannot interact with these people, but she's still watching over them. She's still watching them like a movie. So it could be Yukuko trying to experience. And she wants to participate. She she yeah she does want to participate, but she literally cannot because she's on a different layer, just like. Ikuko is to the characters she's writing about. Yeah. And Oh, I, I was I was gonna add on to that with the whole idea with like uh, Toya, whereas like Ikuko is like doing this as like a study of friendship and to like kind of like observe it and like, you know, like figure it out in her own mind. Whereas Toya would be like, Oh, like why isn't Hanyu joining in? Like she's their friend. <laughs> like, you know, like like let Hanyu like why why can't you just be part of the friend group? Make some friends, Ikuko. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get out touch some grass go outside 
there's the whole aspect to Hanyu about her being like uh, descended from the whole. Uh, I, it's been so long since I've interacted with the Hinamizawa lore, but basically. No, she's a descendant from the aliens. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. aliens are the monsters that come from the swamp. Uh, so like in, uh, I'm just gonna call her Featherine. I can't get these names straight. Featherine <laughs> is like okay, so she's like a ghost and she's just chilling out and she can't interact with people. And then Battler is reading this, and he's like, "Freaking, why not? No, literally. <laughs> you know, put her in the damn story. That'll fix the logic." Which, error. which fits so well with like the way like Toya handles writing episode eight, where it's like, "Why can't Angie come on? Yeah. Why can't we play little fun games? Why can't Kinza like his grandchildren? Why not? What? Because it's literally a cat box. Like, I love the Kinza stuff. So, like." so much with episode 8 because it's like oh how could Kinzo be this loving grandfather and also this terrible person he can not only is it a cat box people just have different sides to them and you could interpret it in different ways yeah like I, I, you can even see like yeah. a little hint of that in episode 1 of Echo, where like Battler's like dude like grandfather would never be late to dinner like <laughs> isn't he always like here on time like he, he likes like you know like coming like here like he thought it was so weird that kinzo wouldn't like be here with his family you can't be on time to the dinner if you're straight up dead <laughs> yeah um uh, yeah uh, getting back um the, the the point where the idea we were discussing diverges from this one we're discussing now is the reason the loops keep happening is because yeah ikuko is using this as escapism but she's also she also gets frustrated that she cannot have it, so she ends up killing everyone in her story. Like, if I can't have it, you can't have it either. A form of stress relief for her, so that's why the loops keep happening, and Hanyu is the one that has the looping power. And, like, you know, the certainty of, like, well, if they can't have it, like, if I can't have it, they can't have it, is, like, the Lambda Delta yeah. side of it, where it's just, like, I'm just gonna keep killing them and killing them and killing them, and they're not gonna escape from this because I'm bitter. <laughs> exactly, which is why which is why these ideas are mutually ex... ex uh, um, Wait! I, 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 I have ideas. I have an idea. I, I raised my hand up high. Um, oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Maybe Toya, Toya didn't directly edit it. Maybe Ikugo changed and wrote the final Higurashi story when she started getting to know Toya and like have him live with her and like actually made her first friend. Oh, that's, oh, that's sweet. But wait, how does that change anything? It doesn't. It just like, changes like the the idea that Toya like like you know like actually like purposely like went in and went like why not you know like I think it's like possible that like Toya like opened up Ikugo's heart a little that's, bit. That's that yeah that tracks because well it is Han Yu like a feather in space Han Yu that does that, that does turn the tables around and it still tracks with the outsider influence because it is still a person who wasn't originally present when the story was getting written, that influenced the writer. So it still tracks with that. Mm -hmm. kind of, I like that. I, I just kind of like it. That kind of tracks with the, the whole theme of the end of Higurashi, which is that if you thought of a solution to the world, then, wow, you created a world that beat Ryukishi's world. Good job. You won. Uh, so the idea of like trying to find a new interpretation besides all these tragic versions of the story, it's very fitting. Yeah, but we still we still need to merge the two because in my interpretation of the wolves happen because Fadrin wants to kill them means that when the Delta and Fadrin are working on the same side and your interpretation is that it's a game we still need to merge that part. Well, that actually, part. I don't think I, I think that Fadrin can write it um, or Ikigo can write it in the way that it is a game between like you know like Rika and Takano, aka a game between um, the certainty that Takano will win and Rika wanting to keep her friends alive um, and that's like part of the story because like. You know, Sayo writes her forgeries where it's a game between Beato and Battler, but she's still writing <laughs> the conflict, you know? Um, like, it's still a game between them, even mm, though there's one author. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Ah, okay. Wait. Damn. Oh my god. Then Higurashi is so weird. It's like a stare. Because okay, Takano is fighting. Takano is on the game board layer, fighting Rika on the metal layer. And then Rika is on the metal layer, fighting upper metal layer, Feadorin and Wambda. Like, no one's fighting on the same plane. Yeah. That's so funny. It, it, is, it is really funny, because, like, you know, like, in, in the hypothetical meta, um, even though, like, 
feathering piece would be on you and you would think that technically she's on the side in like the the higurashi universe like in the meta of higurashi feathering would have abandoned them which means she's still fighting against feathering regardless um in terms of not like directly opposing but fighting in in spite of like feathering abandoning her to these horrible whims of lambda delta i also like the is this deafened yeah ripped to death <laughs> is deafened this is so sad why'd he abandon us like this just like feathering <laughs> oh no we've been left to deal with this honor okay there you are Des. <laughs> i left you just like feathering i really oh, that's God. what i just said what, that literally that's what left said. oh my god <laughs> <laughs> like, how are we gonna fend for ourselves in the recording yeah. it's like we have the same brain oh right no way I, I remembered what I was going to say, that um, I, I like that after the events of Higurashi, uh, an element, not necessarily Rika holistically, but a piece of Rika, that, and also not a piece like a game board, like a, a fragment, no, 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 that doesn't work either, uh, an aspect of Rika got elevated oh, to God. become Burn Castell because now, and now she has the time looping powers that Hanyu had that because burn cause power is to do things over and over again until you reach the miracle that you're looking for as long as mm-hmm. it's possible so it's like that power is like sh- that power is like passed on wait not kind of like metaphorically she does but she's she's really just looking at all the different possibilities she's yeah. not forcing. i mean she's searching through every single fragment like tediously which takes forever which is pretty much like what rika did where she like but like Rika had to do it manually, where she went and experienced yeah. like intimately, like each and every fragment that she searched through, like find trying to get the right one and dying at the end. Yeah. Whereas Burn Castell can just go through the sea of fragments, be like one million nine hundred ninety seven. Um, <laughs> like and, and, yeah, and <laughs> that's kind of what magic even is, which is that it's sort of like a shortcut where you start with the task, and then how you get to that solution could be magic or it could be a human possible solution it's it's just like becoming a witch yeah becoming a witch meant that burn castle doesn't have to go through it manually she can just sort of skip that part and say yep that effort went into it or i did it with magic and now we're here because you know like ma- magic i mean technically because magic is covering up like the the process like i i think you know burn castle still does have to search through all of them but it doesn't like yeah it depends you. Depends how real Burn Castell is, depending on your interpretation. Yeah, that, that depends on your interpretation of how magic works in the meta world and like blah 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 blah. Yeah. Um, but like, regardless, like, you know, like she, she still has to look through all of those, which takes a hot minute. But um, no, yeah, uh, shit, what was I gonna say? I don't know. I forgot. Okay, then I'm, I'm gonna keep yeah. going, and if you remember it, raise your hand. The, the thing that we came up with some time ago about how but were influenced Ikuko to eventually revisit Higurashi and actually end it. Um, that tracks with how uh, Ikuko eventually agreed to stop writing forgeries because they were affecting a real life person. And so I'm just gonna read the last paragraph of of the thing that I that that I posted on the mm-hmm. server because I, I I don't think I can put it better than I did when I wrote it. Uh, a betcha insane person like her eventually agrees to stop writing the forgeries because they are affecting a real life person. That's why EP6 suddenly stops and everything beyond that becomes a hit piece on the readers. But then in EP8 she's fighting one of the Butler and G tech team. I don't remember EP8 at well to interpret anything beyond this point, but I, so I'm not sure if she actually turns a new leaf or if she's just reluctantly stop she, she just reluctantly stops writing um because in eph she's fighting uh the good side the the who who she, she supposedly started suppo- supporting when she stopped writing the forgery so there's a, a, some contradiction going on here but that's because you can interpret the truth revealing conference of eph both ways it can both have been Ikuko being wookie salty that she had to to do what her only friend asked her and stopped writing forgeries and then she had a joker moment and decided she was going to release the whole truth and then was stopped by Toya or Angie on the real world but it could also be interpreted as the cancellation of the revealing of the book of the single truth being planned all along as a final fuck you to the witch hunters which would track with her actually turning a new leaf because of Toya's influence 
And that's where Mineko's Golden Truth comes in again. You, if you like Ikuko, you can choose to believe she really did turn a new leaf. Mm-hmm. And the cancellation was planned all along. Because uh, one, one thing to remember about EP8 um, is even though like she did like absolutely eviscerate Lambda Delta, that's only because Lambda Delta went to attack her because she was trying to buy time for Battle on Angie because she thought like, oh shit, if like Feathery meets him, it's over because like Branca stills her Miko and like blah, 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 blah. Um, but the thing is when Feathering actually like gets there, after the stalling of time, she's like, oh, Angie, my Miko. Like, what, you're gonna harm my Miko, Burn Castell? This is my new Miko, my beloved. You don't, we don't fight her. She can do what she wants. And Burn is like, rah, like, I hate it here, grr, 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 and, like, starts getting all pissy. <laughs> um, but, like, Featherine isn't actually an enemy to Angie. It's just that she's interpreted as such because she's, like, supposedly on Burn Castell's side. Yeah, which we can interpret her to not actually be on Bird Castell's mm-hmm. side. She's just letting Bird Castell does do as she wants to to on the real world level goad the witch hunters into the conference to then well, Bern is her character. Mm-hmm. She can just let her plans fail if she just so wishes. Yeah. Just like she can just cancel the can the conference if she just so wishes, which is exactly what she does. Yeah. If we want to interpret it that way, of course. I, I think that's a fun way to interpret it. You could also um, interpret that um, because, you know, Feathering being the um, the combination of Ikuko and Toya, you could also interpret, like, the two sides of that of, like, possibly being their enemy and possibly being their friend of, like, the Ikuko who is heartless and just wants, like, a, you know, like, a, a d- difficult uh, time and, like, wants to, like, go into, like, the nitty-gritty tearing at the guts with, like, Bern Castell fighting the the Toya side of her, which cares about Angie and actually wants uh, her to have a good life. And, you know, either way, it's still, like, in the real world will translate to Toya kind of getting you could go to not reveal the the truth, whether she's doing it out of spite for the readers at that point or whether it's, like, a last minute, like, please don't do this. But I I really like um, keeping in mind how um, Feathering is the both of them combined because it makes a lot of her contradictory actions make sense where she's, like, really nice and, like, accommodating with Angie and like has a little fun with her but then she's a monster with Burn Castell because it's kind of like showing the two sides of her of like you know the the witch um who's cruel and a monster and likes ripping the guts out of things and like going like being cruel to her pieces and everything when she's with Burn Castell versus the side that actually like you know is being silly goofy and gives a shit about Angie um and like cares about her and like is trying to communicate a message to her uh, being Toya. Yeah, I totally agree. So wait, do we think Yue is like the Feathering only side of... Honestly, the, that's... Yeah, the you could call it only side of Feathering. That's a spicy interpretation, especially if you consider the idea that like Higurashi was mostly written before Toya came into her life. Um, and so like it mm-hmm. would make sense that like it's like a, a Ikuko only thing where Toya doesn't have an influence. Um, and the only influence is, like, the way, like, he's changed Toya outside of the game, but it's not like he has, like, a direct, like, influence, you know? Yeah. Oh, wait! Sorry, I just kind of had, like, a fun idea with... Oh, yeah, please, let me know. Because, okay, because uh, at, at the end of, like, Umineko, obviously Battler's on Lambda Delta side, so, like, Battler and, and Lambda Delta, aka Toya, um, is kind of sided with Lambda Delta, whereas Featherine is more sided with, uh, like, Burn Castell and is more cruel. So... If you kind of look at, God forbid, I, I make Go interesting or, or good or anything like that, <laughs> um, maybe we'll, we'll call it Megary. Go on. Megary's a lot better. But if you look at the conflict there and you think about it as you could go revisiting Higurashi for whatever reason, it could be because Toya might be moving on. Um, either like he might be like about to, like, maybe he's, he's sick, maybe he's dying, maybe he wants to like move on with his life, maybe he wants to move out. And she goes back to her old self-destructive habits. Yeah, and she's it's kind of like the conflict of, like, Rika's is leaving, like, whatever, and, like, is, like, that conflict of, like, I want to still be with my friend, but how can we be friends if we're, like, doing oh different God. things? Um, and eventually, like, them parting ways. That makes so much sense. And not only that, you could call if she was her only friend, of course she's going back to her fictional friend, Rika, she wants her back. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, her old, like, fictional friend and, like, you know, like, retaking the the certainty rule of Gurger, you're not gonna leave me. Um, whereas, um, you know, like, 
Toya would be in the role of Rika because like Rika is the one who like you know like found the power of friendship and like actually like got her happy ending um and like Hanyu like kind of like giving Rika that last little like out of like if you want to leave you can leave um like whenever you want um so what does it mean that Rika wins is that she she goes back to her old habits but eventually it does stop for good yeah I, I I can definitely see Go as like a kind of like you could go trying to like process the feelings of grief of like losing possibly losing a friend because a friend wants to like move on with his life but like it doesn't mean they, they they'll never Damn. see each other again that's really cool that's really cool see, go go on paper is good it's just that it's, it was just the execution like go itself isn't bad the execution was so bad like because like because uh, with Megary, like Megary's really good like if you like read it um it's a lot better than what we got with like Go and Satsu, so I, I just think like it, the the studio really botched it. And you can even see in interviews with like Riikishi, where um, like they're like asking him about like the Go like the anime adaptation, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I, I didn't expect them to do some stuff." Uh huh. That yeah. That they really? Did. Yeah. Wait, where's the interview? I didn't read that. You know, there, there's, uh, I'll have to like look around um, and like pull some up for you. But like in interviews where like Ryukishi is like being asked about Go and like how like the studio like adapted it, he seems like so like like ah yeah they, I mean they they sure did stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like he's like trying to be so polite but you can tell he's not a fan of what they did with his work because mm. like even then he was like he was like i was so surprised about like how like brutal they made like the intestine scene and how much like focus they put on it and i was surprised they made like the the you know the uniforms for the detention at um saint lucia look like prison uniforms i wasn't expecting that um mm. They, they took a lot of creative liberties in Riki. She was just kind of like, well, like, you know, like, I'm not really great at, like, anime directing. Like, that's, like, their expertise. Like, I'm, like, the visual novel guy. So, like, if they think something's going to adapt better in a visual format like that, then I'm just, I, I just kind of trusted them to do what they did. But you can tell that, like, he's like, I wish I didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, he didn't he say he handed them a, a whole notebook of... Yeah, he gave them, like, a really thick outline. Yeah. Like, the pro- problem with Go isn't this yeah, isn't the skeleton it's that they spent so much time on repeating things that they shouldn't and so little time on actually developing Satoko in a way that her change doesn't feel weird and forced and and, and Rika too they also spent so little time going through Rika's mindset because if, if meta world Rika Hiku Castella as I call her is supposed to be a front row character this time we should at least get in her head every once or twice so that we understand why she's being so cold to Satoko in the real life. Because otherwise it just feels like she's being a bitch to Satoko. Mm-hmm. And Satoko feels just like... It just has a, a weird Joker moment out of nowhere. Yeah. They should have spent more time with the real characters. Yeah, and I'm sad that they didn't, like, have, like, Satoko, like, break down and explain, like, the actual reason why she was upset that Rika was leaving instead of just, like, I don't want to study! Like, come <laughs> God, yeah. I was really expecting, like, an emotional moment, like, where, like, Satoko actually confided in what was actually wrong. Um, because, like, it's very clear that's not the only thing that's wrong, but it made it feel, like, for the casual watcher that that's what it was, and it felt really bad. <laughs> yeah, it felt like Rika just wanted to be with the cool kids, and then Satoko just didn't want to study, which is horrible. Why would you... <laughs> Why? <laughs> very glad I'm they still with so Satsu 3. I'm pure. <laughs> Good on you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I don't have any more thoughts. Do you? Time for a oh ten hour conversation about where Kikonia is. Oh my God, Kik- <laughs> the, the the theory you 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 talked about at the end after the final Jeopardy on your part made me go through like a, a whole revolution of how I interpret the layers because it is very true that we don't. That's what that's what made me realize that we don't know if the meta umineko layer is on top or below of the real umineko layer because. Your idea, if I remember correctly, is that the, the characters in Umineko are being controlled by the characters in Kikonia and all the CPPs, and that's why you have different versions of the same character. Yeah, my, my whole idea is that Kikonia comes first in the timeline, and they're all in the meat spine factory, like the little brain spinal cord factory, and they're like hooked up to these computers, and um, they're like, you know, living their VR lives, and Higurashi and Umineko are different, like little VR, like VR, like game simulations where 
um, CPPs of various characters, so are like engaging in them. So that's why you can have like Lambda Delta and Takano and Satoko and whoever the else the fuck else is a thirty four all like exist and like and you were Federine. Yeah, all and like they're they're just CPPs of the same person, which is why they look so similar and possibly have similar motifs, but they're not like the exact same, and that's why they can kind of interact with each other. Um, and they can do that in VR, especially because, like, you know, like, there's no reason you can't have, like, two avatars in, like, share brain, you know? Because, like, mm-hmm. Meow can be on, like, one side of, like, the, the bath while um, Meow Male can be on the other side of the public bath and have, like, <laughs> the same conversation, like, in VR. So I, I feel like it just kind of makes sense from from that perspective and it also makes sense why like Awa would call <laughs> Satsuko like anomalous spinal cord anomalous spinal like, cord because <laughs> it would be like the core it would be the core person yeah, that would that's be... spotting all, all these different people yeah and obviously like when you're a witch you're aware that you're in VR and it also can make um, especially the Higurashi uh, tea parties diegetic because if you view it as just like a game that they're like playing like you know like they're like in vr playing uh-huh. this game then like when they have their little tea party after like where it's like being like whoa that was crazy like i wonder what was going on like you went wild there and like we all died like what was that like mm-hmm. you know like and then they go back and play the game and they try to uncover more of the mystery it's like playing a horror game in vr you know like that's what they're doing yeah exactly and the reason all of this kikoni information makes it so this world from the other game, Umineko, you don't you don't actually know if the real world is above or be or below the meta world is because only with Umineko information you would say yeah no the meta world is below the real world because meta world characters are written in the real Umineko world but then with Kikoni information it could just be that the meta world of the Voyager witches not the meta world that Beato exists in. So the meta world of the Voyagers, like they're just in the VR selection screen. They're like going through like the different. Like, yeah, that that that's just the Kikonia virtual yeah, world. Yeah, they're, they're just like. And then Umineko is just one of the stories that they can play in. Yeah, pretty much. Like that's that's kind of like what I am, and I think like some people do genuinely believe that they live in their VR, but like witches and people who can traverse like the meta are people who have become self-aware that they are playing uh, games and they can traverse to other places, and they're not like really content just sticking around in like one universe. Oh. Yeah, that's just like the Bern poem where she's like, uh, I thought I was the most fortunate, unfortunate. No, so someone thought they were the most unfortunate. C- ah, fuck, how was it? Let me look it up. It also explains how, like, Okanoki can just be, like, the same guy across, like, all three worlds that just, like, exist. Um, because Okanoki could just be traveling across a different VR. Yeah, that's how it came up. That That was the theory that brought this up. Uh, I was the most unfortunate. I knew there was no exit out of this maze. You were the second most unfortunate. You didn't know that there was no exit out of this maze. But then, the rest weren't so unfortunate. They didn't know that they were in the maze in the first place. Oh, man, that's like yeah. frog in the well level shit. I, I don't remember that. What's that from? It's, uh, I believe this is the poem that in the PS3 replaces the frog in the well oh. uh, poem. Let me let me look it up. Because I think the frog poem is actually a real poem that exists. The frog in the well was happy because he wasn't interested in the outside world. The frog in the well was happy because he didn't have anything to do with the outside world. And you were happy too because you didn't know what happened outside the well. Yeah, yeah. I I think I think that kind of encapsulates like the whole <laughs> VR theory really well. Um, I also yeah. um, really like it in terms of like. When, you know, they go to visit the Sea of Fragments, it's just like, you know, them just like picking out like what like little little world they're going to go to next. Mm-hmm. And checking checking in on the VR selection screen where they're scrolling through their, <laughs> their story or game options. Yeah. And then when they say, let's meet again when something else cries, it's just them saying, oh, let's meet again in another game of this same uh, uh, series where we'll use this same... Uh, avatars of Bern Castell and Lambda Delta to play against each other. Yeah, and they may never find one because what if there there aren't any more games? What if they can't find another When They Cry game? Yeah, what if Ryukishi never releases Phase 2 and they never get to play again when something else cries? No, literally. Like, it sucks. And that's why they can just, like, traverse it for, like, out forever and ever because, like, you know, like, they're, they're probably going to be playing other games there as well, like Rose Guns Days. Oh my god, so true. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know. Like, it, it's obviously, like, pretty far like theory like i i know like a lot of people wouldn't subscribe to it but i i think it's like 
my my favorite way to connect all the the when they cry universes together i i like that theory but it's not something i'd subscribe to uh because i i prefer the more magical interpretation than which is so oh, valid that's fine. even though sci-fi sci-fi is fantasy but you know it, i just prefer it them being in a, like a vague yeah. void of magical powers than in, in, in a vr space no, that's totally fine. Cause again, we don't know which world's on top of each other. Yeah, we don't we don't know what's real and what's fake. Everything in When They Cry is like pretty much up to interpretation, which is what I love so much about it. Why you can just yeah. discuss it forever. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was gonna say, uh, re- still with the previous interpretation, it's just that if, but the fact Butler is in Rusgan's days doesn't actually have to mean that Butler eventually ascended. Uh, it can just mean that some. It's a CPV. It's. Or, or either that or someone wrote a character based on a character they read about in another story. Yeah, no, it can be any any of the above. Um, it doesn't have to be from the same writer or anything. That's kind of how actual stories work, where like mm. everything is sort of just a, a, like a, you regurgitate everything that you have uh, inputted in terms of your, your stories that you've read, and that like even a a story that looks wholly original and is not copying anything in the slightest it's even based on your own experiences and your own reading so it's fascinating well we have been recording for 2 hours and 20 does mm-hmm. anyone else have anything else to say yeah i guess i would say like as one of my closing thoughts is that if anything that we've proven here today is that there's still room for theory crafting in Higurashi, Umineko, uh, Kikonia, no matter what. So, like, if you're yeah, watching this true. and you have a theory, just write it and share it with the world because I want to hear all these theories. Why don't you put your theory in the comment section below? Yes, do it. Yeah, even if it's not a full theory, as we've seen on this episode, unfinished theories can totally enable actually complete theories from someone else. Mm-hmm. So. It may, your your unfinished theory may be the missing piece in someone else's theory. Okay. I'll put my own unfinished theory in the, in the comments. Uh. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I guess. I think we're all good. This is it. We have checked the fandom for the second time. We still don't not, don't have any new information on F. F Silent Hill F. We still don't have any new information on Kikonia Phase Two. So hopefully next year when we do the next uh, fandom check, we'll have some more things to check up on please i want rikichi to finish silent hill left so we can give us phase two of kakonia so bad (laughs) he never promised he would though that's the scary part but that's like the thing that's preventing him from working on it right now supposedly supposedly allegedly allegedly but like i can't think of any other reason why he wouldn't post it because he he clearly really loves kakonia it's like his little like baby project that he, he cares a lot about i'm glad you have that confidence (laughs) <laughs> Kikonia has become nostalgic. It has. I was listening to Kikonia music to use it on the anniversary episode, and I was feeling nostalgic. And then I looked at the time; it was published four years ago. It's fucked up. That's really fucked up. We should have all four phases of Kikonia by now, but we don't. Honestly, I'm glad though that Ryukishi is taking his time. <laughs> I I just hope that it does. It isn't like seven no, yeah. years y- per episode. I, I hope that it's not like a nine year hiatus like Haruhi season. It's Mio been was. on the oven for so long; it's burnt already. Okay, anyway, anyway, let's close the episode. Yeah. Any more thoughts? No, I guess I'm done thinking. Wait, doesn't that mean I'm dead? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I mean, you can start thinking again whenever you want. Well, think about something else. <laughs> Alright, well, we hope you enjoyed the episode. And, yep, see you. Bye. Bye.